the legislature and Governor Purdue reach a deal on reforming the state health plan. Proposed reforms for the Racial Justice Act spark debate. And would you donate part of your state tax refund to support state government? Next. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Hello, I'm Kelly McCullen. Legislative Republicans and Governor Bev Perdue reached a deal on reforming the state health plan this week. The compromise makes reforms to the plan's oversight permanent while keeping one free health insurance tier alive for now. House and Senate Republican leaders reached a deal this week with Governor Bev Perdue on legislation that will reform the state health plan in 2011-2012. Talks had snagged in recent weeks over whether or not the health plan can still afford to offer any free basic health insurance tier. The House had agreed to find money. The Senate said the plan was losing too much money. But the agreement in place will allow the state health plan to tap its own cash reserves to maintain one free health insurance option, at least temporarily. If it does have sufficient funds, it is given the permission to offer the basic plan premium free to employees during the fiscal year 2011-2012. The bill also contains a reform provision giving the state treasurer and a new health plan board oversight of the state health plan. Legislators will no longer provide direct oversight. It was a provision the State Employees Association of North Carolina had sought, even with possible employee and retiree premiums being part of any deal. But by passing the reform bill, supporters say at least one big issue will be solved, the oversight issue, if not long-term fiscal solvency for the state health plan. One we can solve dealing with it here and get it over to the treasurer and that's where it's headed and um, you know and then we uh, what's the correct word uh, ask the treasurer to continue to find savings through various programs to continue to offer the free 70-30 to active. House Democrats who had accused House negotiators of surrendering on a free health insurance option in negotiations with the Senate earlier in May rallied behind this compromise. I see this as, as the right fix. I know there's a guarantee for only one year, but I see this as the right fix. I see this as something that upholds the uh, previous House position, a, a House position that 80-some uh, of us uh, took. The governor's office has indicated Governor Purdue will sign this legislation. The next discussion of whether state employees and retirees can maintain a free health insurance option will come under a different health plan management structure and will depend on how much efficiency can be gained from a health plan that's losing money. The state health plan will offer two enrollment periods this year since this bill was passed late in the spring. The House passed legislation this week allowing you to claim pathological materials your doctor removes from you. Organs, bodily fluids, medical waste, pathology slides, they're all yours for the asking if you request them within 30 days. All medical records associated with those bodily materials will be released to you as well. This bill sits in the state Senate. The House passes legislation to restrict inmates and parolees from accessing state workers' personnel records. State records detail a government employee's age and name and hiring date, a contract, salary, other notes. Well, corrections officials are also state employees and lawmakers don't want them subjected to possible harassment. This bill attempts to address unintended consequences of persons in the custody of are under the supervision of the Department of Corrections and persons in the custody of local confinement facilities accessing public employee records exposing those employees to the risk of harassment and in some instances violence. The bill's effective date is December 1st if made law. The Senate has received a House-approved bill to punish thieves who seem to steal only enough property to chronically face 
misdemeanor charges. The proposal creates a seven strikes in your out limit. Seven misdemeanor larceny convictions would trigger a felony level habitual larceny charge that carries some jail time. Misdemeanors do not. Legislative analysts believe 5% of larceny convicts would trigger this new felony charge. A House Judiciary Committee began debating reforms for the Racial Justice Act. Condemned inmates can use this act to argue that racial bias played a role in them receiving a capital sentence. Racial Justice Act supporters say they have statistics that prove racial bias exists in sentencing. Opponents say numbers do mislead. A House Judiciary Committee launched a multi-week discussion and debate over changing North Carolina's Racial Justice Act. This act allows condemned inmates to argue that their juries exercised racial bias in sentencing them to death. A successful argument in court would result in a condemned inmate having their sentence changed from death to life without parole. Racial Justice Act supporters say those who oppose this law have inaccurately claimed that condemned inmates could be set free. It's a tool. It will not get anybody out of jail. We want to clear that up, say they're going to get out of jail. Nobody's going to get out of jail. Senate Bill 9 would eliminate as an argument statistical and historical data on local juries who have issued death sentences. That data currently can be used to suggest some areas, if inadvertently, exercise racial bias in capital cases. District attorneys disagree with statistical interpretation and they told the committee as much, as did Victims Assistance Network co-founder Dick Adams, who says throw out all the statistics. I've heard a lot of statistics today on both sides has absolutely nothing to do with justice. Racial Justice Act supporters like Representative Rick Glazier say you need these safeguards against racial discrimination in capital cases as long as there can be any question about a jury or a prosecutor's possible bias. If we continue to have doubts in our society and confidence in our system because someone made a decision to prosecute someone on the basis of race or execute them on the basis of race or excluded jurors from their jury on the basis of race, that's not uh, part of who we are as North Carolinians or Americans. But the opponents will counter that the Racial Justice Act is basically an anti-death penalty tool, that it gives condemned inmates just another delay tactic. They cite white inmates who have killed white victims who are now claiming racial bias in their death sentencing. But the discussion will continue in a few weeks, with committee members next getting their turn to argue for and against reforming the Racial Justice Act. I think 99% of them have uh, filed claiming that a, a, a white man can be uh, can be can allege racial discrimination if a white jury sentences him to death. It's absurd. But we're the only state in the nation that does this. House Majority Leader Paul Stem says the Racial Justice Act reform debate will continue in a few weeks. The bill requiring women seeking abortions to receive mandatory information and ultrasound and then wait 24 hours before that procedure passed the House Appropriations Committee Thursday morning. Analysts say the bill would cost the state up to $7.5 million a year. Most of that expense would come from Medicaid claims for more births because it is believed more Medicaid clients would decline abortions after initially seeking them. The House and Senate agree to increase protection of adult care home residents. Adult care homes would write up and then follow written infection control policies have their handling of injections audited and send their supervisors to annual infection control classes. Any new employees would take 10 hours of professional training and then prove that they can properly administer medicines and injections. These new rules will take effect immediately. The House Government Committee passes a bill to hold state contractors liable for their new employees' immigration status. State agencies already run all their new, newly hired workers through the E-Verify program, so supporters of this bill say there's no burden to business. Opponents say E-Verify, however, is just inaccurate enough to be troublesome. And it requires them to use the federal E-Verify system in new hires. If they do any contracting with a public entity, they must use and certify that they use the E-Verify system for any new hires that they have. There's been a growing number of demand for E-Verify, and with that comes uh, a lot more errors uh, that affect 
primarily U.S. citizens and American workers. The bill now moves to a House Judiciary Committee. Democrats and Republicans are at a stalemate over an unemployment benefits bill the governor vetoed a few weeks ago. The GOP passed a benefits extension bill, but they included a separate provision in it, funding state government for one year if no budget bill gets passed by July 1st. Democrats say that's unacceptable to the bill and to the state budget process. The GOP-controlled legislature passed an unemployment benefits extension bill a few weeks ago, but they included an unrelated provision that would fund state government with a 13 percent cut from this year's spending level for one calendar year. That would begin July 1st if no budget bill is passed and signed by Governor Purdue. Democrats say that continuing resolution added to the unemployment benefits bill poisons the legislation, which the governor vetoed. It raises the question whether the Republican leadership really wants unemployment benefits to pass or not because they have the uh, means to solve this right away. Legislative Democrats say Republican leaders have been speaking with the governor's team about unemployment benefits extension legislation. Talks House Speaker Tom Tillis confirms. I sat down with the governor last week. I said, Governor, please, let's get together and come up with a compromise solution. Let's shorten the uh, continuing resolution uh, period. Let's even shorten the amount that she would have to target for reductions. But let's actually demonstrate to the citizens of North Carolina that we're willing to work together. To this point, I haven't heard a response. The Democrats say if they were to agree to fund state government for the entire 2011-2012 budget cycle through a continuing resolution and not an official state budget bill, the Republicans wouldn't negotiate a budget bill at all. I want them to do a budget. I want us to have a debate about the teachers we're firing, about the teacher's aides that we're firing, about the people in mental health that aren't going to be able to get help out there. And I want that debate to occur over here like it's supposed to and like the Constitution says we'll do. GOP leaders have told this show in weeks past that a continuing resolution would preserve the budget terms that were passed by the previous Democratic legislative leadership, and they were elected to change things in Raleigh. House Speaker Tom Tillis says to expect his team to move on unemployment benefits soon. Most likely next week we will actually just put something out there. In the absence of that leadership, we'll take the lead and try and do something for the interest of reinstating these benefits. There is currently no unemployment insurance bill under active consideration. It's an issue we'll keep following for you. A Judiciary Committee endorses the bill to further limit campaign contributions between vendors holding state contracts and state lawmakers. The bill carries a January 1st, 2012 start date and would target what is commonly considered pay to play. It carries broad bipartisan support. So if you have a contract with the state of North Carolina in excess of $25,000, certain employees and board members um, will be limited to making only up to $500 contributions to the candidate or to either candidate, whether it's the incumbent candidate or their opponent. The law would not apply to any state vendor who is seeking office and supporting their own campaign. The House voted this week to reduce North Carolina's early voting period by one week. Supporters say the time reduction will save local governments money because the final week of early voting is always when you see the rush of voters. Opponents say losing that first week would hurt the African-American vote. It's inconvenient. It would create a rush of early voters late, and that would require additional early voting sites. The debate will continue in the Senate. The House narrowly passed legislation this week to regulate how local governments may special or schedule special elections. The lawmakers behind this bill say local governments schedule special elections on days when they know turnout will be very light, and that can help controversial proposals like local tax referenda get passed. Their proposal would require special elections to be held only on days of statewide general elections or local general elections. A special election to elect a new sheriff would not be restricted, nor would any votes on matters of safety and public health. Three House members propose a law to force presidential electors to heed the results of presidential elections. The legislation would force electors to cast their electoral vote for the presidential candidate that wins the popular vote in North Carolina. The bill passed the House this week 112 to 1. We have had in North Carolina uh, an instance of a, an elector who was chosen to, to represent one, uh, one candidate. 
and that candidate won the state, and then the elector actually voted for another candidate. So we have had this happen in our state uh, before. The bill outlines a pledge every electoral voter would take. Violators would vacate their offices by law. House Republicans and Democrats back legislation to regulate public school snack food nutrition standards during lunchtime hours. The House Education Committee passed the bill this week. Some House members of both political parties believe federal regulation of optional food offerings in school cafeterias during lunch hour is not enough to ensure that students are eating healthy foods. Their proposal would allow the state to step in and set specific nutritional guidelines on which snack foods could be offered during lunch. It does mean food or beverage that's sold or served to students on school grounds that's not part of the school lunch program. It covers vending machines, school stores, snack bars, fundraisers, and other informal foods. This bill will simply limit uh, access students have to these competitive foods, these high calorie, high fat, low nutritional value. Around 23 other states do the same thing this bill does. So we're not plowing new ground. This, is, this has been done elsewhere. The legislation would give power to the State Board of Education to set those specific nutritional guidelines. The board could tweak and change those rules every year. Whereas now they may have regular potato chips, candy bars, honey buns, those type things. Perhaps we can put baked chips, granola bars, nuts, dried fruits. With federal regulations saying foods with limited nutritional value should be restricted during school lunch hours, backers of these proposed state snack nutritional guidelines say this bill could fight the state's childhood obesity problem. Representative Stephen LaRoque testified some students get the bulk of their daily calories from school meals. Littering fines could dramatically increase under a bill that passed a, a Senate Judiciary Committee this week. Senator David Rouser's bill would set a minimum $1,000 fine and up to a maximum $4,000 fine for a first offense. A second offense within three years of that first conviction would double the minimum and maximum fines. Litter bugs currently face $250 fine for this crime. The Senate is considering House legislation increasing the punishment for drivers who provoke high-speed police chases. The Run and You're Done bill would allow police to seize a driver's car for causing a chase. Suspects would post a bond on that vehicle until their case is heard in court. The bond keeps the, the car until you're either um, uh, in court. If you're proven innocent, you get the car back. If you don't, they keep the car and they sell it. Um, a lien, if there's any lien on it, the lien holder gets a lien on the car. The run and you're done law would take effect this December 1st. A bill to protect utility crews working along roadsides keeps moving through the house. State law right now will force you to change lanes and move away from police conducting a traffic stop. This bill would do the same for telephone, cable TV, natural gas and road construction crews. That's if there's a lane in which we may enter. The House and Senate agree to new incentives for buying electric street legal vehicles. Governor Purdue's signature will allow electric cars in HOV lanes no matter how many passengers are in the car and exempt vehicles from emissions testing. Supporters say electric cars don't need emissions checks. A House bill would allow taxpayers to donate some or all of their state tax refund to fund the state government. It's House Bill 877 would let you support four state departments, including public instruction, donate to the state's general fund, or help out the university system. Your choice. This gives the people of North Carolina an option. If they don't think they're taxed enough, if they want more money to go to K-12, if they want more money to go to the university system, cultural resources, community colleges, this is an opportunity for them to put their money where their mouth is. I think people are pretty clear that this is really sort of a, uh, no, it's not sort of, it's a political device to call the bluff of those who want no sunset on the temporary sales taxes. Representative Sarah Stevens from Surrey County is behind this bill to let us donate uh, tax refunds back to state government. Did Alice Bordson, the representative, get it right with you when she said you're just kind of thumping your nose at people who want to keep that sales tax? No, no. What I'm really doing is the last three years, mm -hmm. and this is only my second term here, so the last three years, different people have come forward and said, tax me more. And I think, in fact, they don't want to be taxed more. They want everybody to be taxed more. So for those people who really have that desire to submit more money to the state because they think programs are important, they needed an avenue because at this point they really can't. They could contribute to their university or they could contribute to their small 
a small amount to their local schools, whereas if we put this together as a pool, we can have it go to the Department of Public Instruction mm -hmm. to meet some of those program needs that are there. Um, it could go to cultural arts, and, 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 a, and a dollar or two, most people think, don't doesn't help, but if you can mass collect it together, then it would be of a great help. We, as I was doing the check off for breast cancer donation, uh, I learned that just the wildlife fund, which is, seems to me sort of a, a very <clears throat> small area of interest, was actually uh, receiving four hundred thousand dollars a year from the checkoffs. And that's said, easy Why to can't understand. We do it? Wildlife fund, but you're talking state general government fund where the taxes they've already paid are going into that, and, you're, and they have the option of giving more to that fund. How does it work, and why can't a North Carolinian just give money to the state government if he or she chooses? She or she chooses. I don't think that there's a mechanism for them to do that. If they send it to the Department of Revenue, the Department of Revenue has got to account for it in some way. And at this point, the only thing they could do is account it toward their future taxes. They would always be shown as having a credit balance. Uh, instead of being able to actually use the funds for some other way and eventually would try to refund it to them because there's not a mechanism in place for them to accept additional revenues and that's what this will do is allow them to accept additional revenues. Why do you think it is so controversial based on the debate that I heard and that you were subject to uh, the controversy surrounding what this essentially is voluntary tax payments versus mandatory taxes? I think that's the controversy. I think everybody would like it to be more of a mandatory tax. Everybody should pay it. Um, and, and they want to tell you how much you should pay. Well, at some point, when we're looking at programs that go beyond what is a core service, I think it should probably be more voluntary. Um, we were discussing today on the floor various bills that say charity is something you do because you want to, a lot of people say charity is what I can get the state to fund and pay for. And, and, I, and I think we need to separate those two out quite a bit. That if people, I get contacted a lot right now from teachers or teacher aides and one of their pet responses is, you know, my child is worth a penny. And I said, that's great. Send all the pennies you want to in. You know, send all the pennies you want to in. We're going to set up a mechanism that will allow you to do that. Um, but, you know, other people where we promised there would not be an increase in the sales tax or keeping that temporary sales tax in place, it was our word, and we meant it. So what we've done is a provision that will allow them to send the extra pennies, the extra sales tax, the monies that they would be saving, anything else they want. But better than that, they get to direct where it goes. Can you, can you say, I want to save teachers' assistance jobs if you want to send a $3 donation off your tax refund? Is it that uh, narrowly focused, or are you just giving it to the Department of Public Instruction, for instance? Right now, because of the one big issue we have, and that was fitting it onto the tax return, we're going to have to look at categories. Uh, there was even a suggestion at one point that what we could do is, is, is have an online system where people could mail it every month rather than just along with their tax returns. And, and with that, we could probably get more specific and get down to a, a, a detailed, this department, this department, this area, this area of expertise. There was talk at one point of leaving it tax me more, send this much money, and let you fill in where you want it to go to. The problem was we can't always read people's writing. Do you expect people to actually do this? Yes. You do? I think there are people who will actually do this. Because I know people fill out a tax return. It's not that, not that much fun. No, it's not that much fun, but they do it with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. They do it with wildlife fun. They do it with Republican and, and Democratic state uh, party campaigns elections if it's before people and they're thinking about it they could go yes I think this one needs more money and five ten fifteen twenty dollars if it's right there in front of them I, I don't think will be a big issue or a big burden representative Stevens thanks for being on the show well thank you for having me it's been a delight a bill requiring hunters to carry written permission of the property owner whose land they're using hits committee after being trimmed a bit. The new proposal would have hunters show their written permission form and a hunting club membership card if they're a member of a club to any law enforcement officer who makes a request. The bill previously carried provisions that would outlaw hunting access on state right-of-ways. That was until this week. Unlike the prior proposed committee substitute last week, which you know, brought in uh, roadside hunting and other issues. This issue just pertains to land that's been, it's privately owned and it, it's, it, it, it's marked or posted accordingly. The bill has a way to go before becoming law, but it would take effect this coming October 1st. 
The Senate passed an energy exploration bill last week, and this week it holds House legislation to study the various energy-creating possibilities in North Carolina. This bill was changed as well. It would have originally established a three-person commission who would go out and actively recruit energy companies. The new bill was changed into an energy exploration study to be conducted by the Environmental Review Commission and the Department of Commerce. Their findings will include feasibility studies and policy recommendations for state lawmakers to consider in 2012. State law defines many products as renewable energy sources. It's an important definition because companies can use those products to meet state green energy standards. Wood waste is defined as our renewable energy source, but not wood. Senator Clark Jenkins proposes defining all wood products as a green energy source. State energy producers must produce over 12% of their electricity from renewable sources by the year 2020. As you surf the internet this weekend, check us out online. Be our friend on Facebook, facebook.com slash legweek. You can watch our web stream at unctv.org slash legweek. Always send us an email. We read every one, legweek at unctv.org. And you can follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle for the show is at NCN Legweek. You can also search my name, Kelly McCullen. That's fine as well. That's our show for this week. We certainly hope to see you next time. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.